Arctic now is, is one of the fastest warming places on the planet. And there are several reasons for that. The, the predominant one um, is that it's, it's at sea level. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as you know, as you go up with altitude, it gets cooler. So if you're at sea level, you're going to experience more of this warming than at altitude. And, and water has this very interesting property. It's a little bit colder than, than 32. Um, it's solid, a little bit warmer than 32. It's liquid. It's actually not quite 32 for seawater because with salt, it lowers the freezing point to 28 and a half or so. But everyone would associate with the 32 for water. And as you see a change in a surface that would be more like your jacket and, and trousers, mm -hmm. um, white and highly reflective to something more like your jersey or my blazer mm -hmm. to something that's dark, uh, the ice melts. You now are no longer reflecting 90% of the energy. You're absorbing 90% of the energy. Which means it's warmer. So it'll warm more. So the water warms. And of course, the water all along was warmer than the ice. That's, that's obvious. But now you make it even warmer, so you melt more ice. So the big changes we're seeing in the Arctic, both in sea ice, but also in the glaciers, Greenland, and glaciers in Antarctica, is the effect of ocean warming. And for sea ice, the effect of this change in the, the reflectivity, losing an area that was reflecting light and gaining one that is now absorbing. And what is that reflectivity? What does it mean? Well, you know, I think we all um, maybe even tried or heard about those experiments when we were children. Um, you, you've got snow in the backyard, and you, you put a, a piece of white cloth and a piece of dark cloth and come back and look a little later. Well, under the dark cloth, um, you, you melted the snow, and it sunk down into the white cloth. It didn't, or less so. So what it means is um, we're now... Uh, keeping that energy in the system and, and accelerating the warming rather than reflecting it back to space. Um, in Antarctica, it's different because uh, you don't have a, an ocean at sea level covered by ice. You've got a basically a mountain of ice. So, so it's mountainous. Yeah, well, it's mountainous, but also it, it's a mountain of ice. Mm -hmm. So 90% uh, of the fresh water on the surface of Earth, not groundwater on the surface, 90% of it is frozen in Antarctica. 90%? 90%. So if that melts, that means it's considerable sea level rising. Uh, yes. Well. <laughs> in addition to the warming, which means an expansion, because anything that is warm expands. Yeah. We could be devastated if, we, if this continues. Well, there's no scenario whereby all that will melt. So, so. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. But, but, but it's, you know, it's 10,000 feet high, and it's basically mm -hmm. a big block of ice mm -hmm. and fills the whole Antarctic Circle for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. In the north, the only thing like that is Greenland. And Greenland also rises to about 10,000 feet, and that's a block of ice. The, the, the solid earth under Greenland, in the center of Greenland, is actually depressed below sea level. Oh, it's by, a hollow. By the weight of this oh. block of ice. If that ice all melted, um, the sum of that depression would rise because it's being held down now by the weight of the ice, so it would buoy back up. But, but basically, Greenland is not a, a, like a, a mountain with a little ice on it. It's, it's a mountain of ice. So we, we've long known that in a warmer world, which is what we're, where we're headed, uh, you will have a warmer ocean, evaporate more water from, from the ocean, and, and it's evaporated water from the ocean, which is the source of our snow. So right here in New England, <clears throat> we're getting moisture, either a nor'easter that brings it back out of the Gulf of Maine, or maybe it comes up from the Gulf and we see a snowstorm moving up through uh, the southeast states in Virginia and Maryland, New York, and we get it. We can get a little bit of snow that maybe comes off the Great Lakes, mm -hmm. but you need a source of moisture. And, and again, most of that for our major storms comes from the ocean. The moisture that, that gets carried into the interior of Greenland or interior of Antarctica uh, falls, in, in particularly that altitude, and particularly in winter, is snow and that gets compressed, makes glaciers. So all the models, uh, any, the simplest model of climate would show that in a warmer world, uh, you will have favorable conditions with a low enough temperature to, to have more snow because there's more moisture in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. warmer, oist, warmer ocean, more evaporation. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's happening is that, that we now, with very careful monitoring of elevation and also 
gravity. That is, gravity on a particular point on the surface of the Earth um, is going to be determined by what's under that point on the Earth. Is it rock? The underlayment. How dense is the rock? Is it water? Mm -hmm. Is it ice? So as you change, we're not doing much to change rock, we're changing water, but if we're changing ice, you can see that in the gravity, on a, the gravitational attraction at a particular point, very precisely with satellite sounds. So, so we know that across the interior of Greenland and Antarctica, we are accumulating more snow and ice, as would be expected. But at the edges, we're losing it. It's and faster, that's what's important. Faster than we're accumulating it. In fact, that's there's a report in. just yesterday I saw in the Arctic Journal saying that over the last decade, uh, between sort of five, six times faster loss of ice from Greenland and Antarctica than was expected just a decade ago. Mm -hmm. One of the contributing factors is, of course, warming of the ocean water, but another that's in play here is something called black carbon, or in the, in the vernacular, soot. What so is that? Small particles of soot, which come from either diesel combustion, the cloud you see no longer in a city like Boston because we're using natural gas for our buses. But the particulate matter the you're talking about? The particulate matter, the, the small particulates, and, and even though you can't see them, some of these are small enough that they aren't, they aren't creating a visible plume, uh, when these land on snow, they're like that little patch of dark cloth. The snow melts faster under them. Um, the forest fires that we're seeing in the, in the, in the northern regions now I see the White House yesterday released a, a new video. Um, Dr. John Holder and the President's Science Advisor talking about forest fires in the West and how um, the conditions that that um, uh, that allow forest fires to to uh, gain uh, the the ground they have to burn hotter, to burn more extensively, are in many cases related to climate change. Um, forest fires in the high Arctic region, where you know you. You do not have the same degree of, of sort of human involvement. That is, are we thinning the forest at a fast mm -hmm. enough rate? Are we, are we uh, perhaps uh, being more reckless in the forest mm -hmm. uh, with, with um, you know, accidentally starting fires? Um, in the Arctic, where the boreal forests, where you have far less human involvement, we're also seeing a great increase in, in, in forest fires, extensive fires in Alaska, northern Canada in recent years, northern Russia. Which are not man-made. No, almost all wildfires um, in the West are started by lightning. I mean, they're occasionally a careless hiker or the like. But lightning starts uh, many, many fires. I've, I've did a lot of mountain climbing in my early days in Oregon and Washington, California. And on a, if you're on a mountain, you see a thunderstorm, you want to take shelter. But you look around, you'll, you'll see lightning strikes, you see fires start. And most of them self-extinguish. But under drier conditions, mm -hmm. fewer of them will. But they're also a source of these fine soot particles. So we know that, that the, the snow and ice in the Arctic, less so in the Antarctic because you, you're further from, from forests or from diesel engines, for example, um, that the, the soot particles landing on the snow and ice are also contributing to a faster rate of melt. So you have the oceans warming, you have the air warming, uh, you have soot particles then uh, creating a, a more intense absorption of the incoming mm -hmm. solar energy. And not the reflection that w would be required. Right. right. Now, what about the actual biology of the oceans? Those are changing too. Uh, isn't there more bacteria and more toxins? Uh, we hear about uh, just the other day, um, I believe it was Lake Erie, it was toxic blooms. Uh, what's going on there? Well, <clears throat> on the, there are changes that we're seeing far and wide in the ocean and on the ocean edges where uh, humans are most directly in contact with the ocean, particularly through our major rivers, uh, we're seeing over the last uh, several decades now uh, increasing um, numbers and areas and, and sort of persistence of, of what we are increasingly calling uh, dead zones. Now they aren't truly dead, but the animals that um, plants that would have historically been there, in many cases economically important, um, have been lost, and hence the, the dead zone. Uh, and the, and the, the contributing factors are the, uh, the runoff, 
largely from agricultural lands, but, but uh, from cities as well, where sewage is, is not being properly treated, uh, and creates a, a super fertile condition in the coastal water. And the biggest one in our U.S. waters is off the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, off the, um, the delta of the Mississippi River. And of course, the Mississippi River has a huge drainage basin from all across central U.S. And the excess phosphorus and nitrogen um, excess applied as fertilizer but not used by the, by the plants, then in many cases gets into the water, flows into the adjacent coastal water, um, and, and creates a, a, a ideal situation for what in the, the sort of vernacular are called harmful algal blooms. So algae are the base of the food web that feeds all the, the animals that we think of as being uh, highly productive in coastal waters, the shellfish, the mollusks, the, the shrimp, the crustacea, the, the bony fishes. And, and if that food chain is interrupted by, by uh, facilitating a faster growth of, of weed-like algae species that are not so effectively eaten by the small animals that would normally eat those, then be eaten by the larger animals to the, the fish that we'd harvest, uh, the whole ecosystem will change and, and becomes uh, sort of overwhelmed by these algal blooms, bacteria associated with them, and certain other sort of gelatinous organisms, we, uh, the whole group we call the selenerates or mm -hmm. tenophores, which, which don't have any um, real economic value and, and very few of them are actually eaten by other species. They just die and decompose. And when they decompose, uh, bacteria then consume this organic matter, they can bring the oxygen levels down and uh, create all sorts of, uh, of unpleasant local conditions. But the biggest problem uh, is that we're, we're not being effective in the, either the appropriate application or, or uh, fertilizers or the treatment of, of waste coming from metropolitan areas. Well, what concerns me is, is Lake Erie is used for water source um, for many of the metropolitan areas in the area. And if we're going to be having um, the, the high bacterial counts, the toxins, uh, we're seeing it beach closings on mm -hmm. the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. We've seen it numerous times. What, where are we going? I mean, is, is this a trend? Uh, you know, I've been reading about um, the sixth extinction. I read the book. I found it fascinating. Um, species disappearing. The tr I believe it was the tree frog in South or Central America, and these species are disappearing. Bacteria are becoming more re disease resistant. I mean, uh, um, drug resistant. Uh, where are we going? Is this? Is there any end? In, is this going to just keep going? <laughs> Uh, well, some of these problems, as you know, are so complicated that there isn't, a, there isn't an immediate <laughs> fix. But I guess the encouraging thing for me is that um, the public uh, has become increasingly aware of these problems. So when I began studying plankton and the ocean and, and uh, uh, what might or might not be changing uh, several decades ago now, boy, the only people that you could even talk to were other people doing the same thing you were. And the fact that we're sitting here now, I'm talking with an attorney uh, about plankton in the ocean was kind of unthinkable, unthinkable 40-some uh, years ago. Um, the the, the uh, brilliant and, and, and really skillful authors like Elizabeth Colbert writing uh, The Sixth Extinction, uh, people now uh, will read and understand that problem uh, the way they hadn't before. The, 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 um, her, her earlier book and the serialized versions of that on, in, uh, in the New Yorker um, on climate change. And, and, and I know many people who uh, first learned about ocean acidification from her, her writings. They, they had no idea that uh, this, this, we sometimes call it the evil twin of global warming, uh, carbon dioxide is warming the earth, but it's also changing the ocean chemistry, mm -hmm. that, that it was even, even something that we knew about. So as, as skillful authors um, uh, turn their attention to these problems and can talk about it in a way a scientist just can't, and scientists you know, are so concerned about being precise, they, they want to point to the graph and they want to point to the tables, and, and someone like Elizabeth Colbert can 
can tell that story without the graphs and tables and, and do it in a way that, that people really understand. So I, I'm, I think that... Um, it really articulated and resonated with, yeah. the, pu with the public. And, and I, you know, you look at public opinion surveys, you look at, at, um, at what people say they want um, in terms of environmental quality, and I think the, the awareness uh, among the public is much greater today than it was at the time of the first Earth Day, you know, when, well, there's some problems, we ought to think about them, and there's some things we could do, but I think, I think the, 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 um, one of the places you're seeing this now is in major cities and, and mayors taking leadership on these topics. They know that their constituencies is really interested in addressing these problems. You look at look at what's happened in just in Boston in the last few decades. Yeah, I mean, for, for our, our viewers, um, uh, the program is being broadcast um, all over the world and it's viewable on the internet. Um, we're broadcasting from the Boston, Massachusetts, the northeast uh, part of the United States and we have a proposed pipeline that is proposed to be put through the state of Massachusetts, high volume frac gas, um, to be exported outside the U.S. Uh, six of the New England, New England governors were on board with this. However, I think they didn't anticipate uh, the, the steadfastness of the people and the resolve of the people of Massachusetts who have been steadily uh, arguing against this. And one of the reasons is, is very basic. Uh, our state of Massachusetts is number one in solar. Uh, it has become the number one state, even surpassing California, in the implementation of solar. And the fear is that if more gas lines are put through the state, uh, there will be more dependency on fossil fuel, and there will not be a good market to compete with uh, traditional fossil fuel, and thereby increasing the anthropogenic causes of climate change um, ad infinitum. Do you have anything to say about uh, <laughs> uh, on that issue? Well, the, this uh, this whole scene of um, of where we get energy, um, particularly for electricity, and what the options are, um, has, has changed enormously over the last uh, twenty years. Um, fracking is not new; fracking has been around for a long time. But to be able to, to use it the way it's being used today, um, you know, th this this was something that that certainly the public was unaware of 20 years mm -hmm. ago, didn't anticipate. Similarly, um, we didn't anticipate how successful um, local, I mean, residential uh, solar energy could be, nor wind. I mean, to have imagined 20 years ago that you'd have states like Iowa or North Dakota that are more than 20% dependent upon wind energy for the electricity right now it was unthinkable. Just, who, I mean, it just seemed impossible. Yeah, nobody would think about it. Um, to see the, the rate at which solar is being installed uh, across the United States and not just rooftop, but, but some of these large facilities are being planned now. And, and also in China, you know, solar and, and wind are being installed yes. in China Let's at talk a about very that. rapid rate right now. Um, so uh, one of the one of the you know underlying uh, concerns here is that um, some of these are mature technologies like oil and gas. Um, some of them are still sort of emerging, trying to to figure out what the right sort of market strategy is. Uh, and so we have the government getting involved with all sorts of incentives and subsidies and the like. And there's constantly a sort of uh, back and forth as to whether we should phase this out or not. Um, you know, the oil companies benefit enormously from government subsidies. Uh, some people feel that um, that's, that's uh, no longer really an appropriate use of government funds. It's a mature technology, mm -hmm. mature business. They should be on their own. And yet um, others, uh, like wind and solar, still need a, a boost to, mm -hmm. to get up to the right level of production mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to have a good strategy for, um, for business. But I mean, how do you see, uh, if we can stop the anthropogenic yeah. causes right here and now, where, where do you see our oceans? Will they return? If we could, if we could just drop the hammer right now and stop it. We, I know it persists in the environment for a very long time, but do you see our, 
any regeneration of our ocean? Sure. I mean, there, there are great examples of this where, um, in terms of, of the, uh, the human, uh, direct human impact with the release of, of material in the oceans, I mean, just uh, Boston Harbor, I mean, uh, with, the, with the design of the construction of the, of the Deer Island sewage treatment plant, uh, which I think opened in about 2001 or so. Which is state-of-the-art. The, the new outflow uh, that, that takes uh, highly processed water. Um, all the particulars are gone. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's water that, that would not in any way interfere with the lives of, of marine organisms. It, it diffused into um, a, the, at the bottom of Massachusetts Bay. Careful monitoring, no evidence of any negative effect at all. It's a dramatic change improvement of water quality in our coastal water here. So, you know, it's not cheap, uh, and, and we pay but for it right cost, now. But the But the benefits are enormous, yeah. enormous. Um, so there are things that we can do, and some places these things are being done. Uh, to, to stop everything immediately is, of course, impossible. What we have to do is figure out how to put the brakes on. And let me come back to your, your natural gas pipeline. I, I think anything we can do right now to make... Uh, non-fossil fuel sources of energy more attractive and a priority. And implement, we should we should um, we should work on. Mm -hmm. I think that we should not provide any sort of of uh, of encouragement or or, or uh, favorable economic um, conditions for conventional or non-conventional sources of fossil fuel. Uh, they've been in that business for a long time. Um, they should compete. With on a level playing field on the regular market, yeah, with the, with the regular market, and you look at other places in the world where, you know, you see uh, wind energy and in in, uh, in Europe now. You look in Germany, and you mentioned uh, China. Can you expound on that? Yeah, well, I mean, China um, China is a serious problem. Um, they have air quality that um, is uh, is choking, literally choking uh, people to death. And there was this wonderful experiment with the Beijing Olympics. And I had colleagues who didn't think that China could do what they said they were going to do, which was clear the air for the Olympics. They didn't th it won't work. They can't do it. Well, they throttled back transportation. They throttled back industry. And by golly, they had, they had beautiful clear air for the Olympics. You know what? People like that. I mean, to see clear skies over Beijing, I realized what it could be. So China has announced recently that... Um, that by 2020, they will no longer allow coal to be burned within the metropolitan area of Beijing. Now, they're burning coal other places for sure, generating electricity. But, but they know that, that, they, that, that they must move away from these, these heavily polluting sources of energy. China um, uh, is, is building nuclear power plants. Um, they, of course, have built some major hydroelectric plants, and it's always, you know, you build a big dam, there, there are pluses and minuses there, mm -hmm. too. But um, they, um, they're, the, they're the nation that has most aggressively developed the technology that can be marketed, um, mass-produced and marketed at, uh, at a reasonable rate for, for solar panels. And that's incredible. So, so you know, uh, and, and then... Uh, you look at, at those decisions and realize that uh, not only are they doing this in their own nation, but they're exporting these, these panels. Here to the U.S. as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because they figured out how to mm -hmm. manufacture them at a scale that makes them less expensive. Uh, China um, um, is not a democracy, as you know. Right. Um, and interestingly, um, historically, their leaders have been, um, in many cases, highly uh, technically trained, and they understand the, the science. I have colleagues who have been very involved, including Dr. Dale Jorgensen, in advising mm -hmm. um, uh, Chinese uh, decision makers on, on their policies. And, and they understand this problem. They, they are not, uh, they're not saying, oh, uh, I don't know, I don't understand the science. Uh, I've got to, mm -hmm. I, I hear you, but I don't know if that's really. Yeah, I have to think about yeah, it. Yeah, right. I've got to talk to my. So, it's, I think, in some regards, a more difficult problem in India. Yes. Where, um, like the United States, they have a democracy. And uh, <laughs> China, can, at the right level, they can kind of do what they want to. 
Um, and I think they're well-intentioned in this, in this sphere. Uh, India, it will be a slower process. Mm. Uh, it, it's, a, it's far more difficult politically in India to move um, uh, aggressively um, to a, a cleaner uh, energy economy. Now, what about the, the Soviet Union? I should say Russia. Uh, it's no longer the Soviet Union, not yet anyway. Um, what about the North Pole? Uh, are they investigating uh, oil exploration over there? Um, well, the, again, uh, not there won't be oil right at the North Pole, but in the the uh, Russia has a huge swath of Arctic coastline. You know, it's like half the globe. It's like twelve time zones, um, and the the oil and gas that you find offshore is going to be in the in the coastal area and the the, the sediments on the continental shelves. Most people don't realize that. Uh, our oil and the gas associated with it um, comes almost entirely from marine organisms. So you think of, of oil wells in the middle mm -hmm. of the United States, well, it's an ancient inland sea. Right. So it's not, it's not the, the tar pit and the dinosaurs mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that give you oil and gas. Almost all of our oil and the gas associated with it come from marine organisms. So when geologists want to know where to find oil, they say, okay, so let me look under today's oceans where there would have been a lot of biological mm -hmm. productivity and, and a, a trough or a canyon where that might have mm -hmm. collected over millions of years. Or on land where we know, so, so we talk about the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania. In fact, shale or sedimentary rock mm -hmm. under sort of ancient inland or ancient seas that are now on land. So the, um, the, the, the whole process of exploring in the Arctic or any other place is going to look at these marine deposits. So they're near shore. One of the interesting uh, questions that's come up in the last few weeks um, after the Ukrainian um, crisis um, is whether the sanctions uh, that are being imposed by the West now will interfere with the, the partnership that was formed a few years ago between our oil giant Exxon and the Russian government. Uh, to, in fact, begin drilling this year in the Russian Arctic. And uh, to what degree that, uh, that association remains um, sort of viable with um, some of the sanctions going in place, I think is an interesting question. But, um, but the Russians, as you know, in our um, coastal waters off Alaska, the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea, uh, shell oil there, have uh, been very interested in exploring with test drills the potential for oil and gas recovery in the Arctic. Um, Shell has found this very difficult. Uh, two summers ago, they had several mishaps. Uh, the Arctic is uh, a very stormy place. Uh, dealing with ice um, is something that um, these companies have very little experience with. And so there, there are enormous obstacles to overcome before you could extract and transport to refineries by mm -hmm. pipe, by ship, um, the, the oil that would be, or gas, that would be mm -hmm. extracted offshore in the Arctic. And again, here we go again, we're perpetuating the cycle of, of fossil fuel. Yeah. Okay. Um, in closing, um, what are your feelings? Um, I know you've testified before Congress. Uh, you, you've been you know, quite vocal in um, different uh, areas uh, regarding the ocean and the uh, issue of um, the climate change. Uh, wh where do you see things going? Um, if I weren't an optimist, uh, I probably uh, had to have left this field some time ago. Um, the fact that, um, that we have really only been talking sort of politically about this problem for a couple of decades can be discouraging, but also it's a relatively short period of time to, to affect the sort of transitions that, that we really need. Um, we, um, we've made enormous progress in the last six years. Um, sometimes it seems slow, disappointingly slow, uh, with uh, this administration in Washington. Uh, you think of just uh, automobile fuel efficiency. So in the mid-70s when Congress um, became concerned about uh, U.S. oil independence and decided one way to, uh, to uh, address that problem was to require automobiles to be more fuel efficient. Um, 
automobiles being manufactured in the U.S. at that time were getting big automobiles, maybe 10 miles per gallon, smaller automobiles, maybe 15 or so. The average was something in the teens. And Congress said, you're going to double it. And Detroit said, well, we, we can't do that. Um, we don't know how to do it. Or no one would want those cars. And you may remember there were economists predicted that, that the carnage uh, from these smaller, lighter cars would be vast. And, and uh, basically, it's a ridiculous uh, mm -hmm. exercise. Um, but uh, they did it. Right, they did it. They did it. And they did it well. They did it well. And, and they can do it again. And, 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 and those, they met those standards by the late 80s. So, you know, in a little over a decade. And so then it plateaued. It sat there. It didn't move mm -hmm. that same fuel efficiency standard. And um, at the same time, they made cars safer. There are fewer auto fatalities right now than there were in 1950 because cars are that much safer. We have more cars on the highway. We drive more miles. But there are fewer fatalities than so, in 1950. So if we can make them uh, not driven on fossil fuel. So, so what, what happened when, when uh, at the time of the big economic crisis, Mr. Obama saw that as an opportunity in working out deals with our major automobile manufacturers to say, okay, one of the other things we'd like to see you do is um, make them even more fuel efficient and set new standards. And they're, they're going to attain them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an exciting time for engineers. It's, a bit it's not, hybrids you know, and, 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 and to, electric. You look, at, you look at the innovation that has come into the automobile marketplace as a result of, of those decisions. So that's, that's very encouraging to see what um, the Environmental Protection Agency has done with the full support of, of the courts. In, 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 um, in, in, as they've met challenges to their authority to regulate carbon dioxide. With, um, with standards now for, for our, our, our stationary facilities, our electric generating facilities, um, th this is, this is, this is uh, an enormous, enormous progress mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen, I know in some cases highly controversial, but uh, the improvement of, of, um, of wind farms, um, we will continue to see people debating whether you know, the aesthetics of, of, um, of one of these installations is offensive to them or idyllic. Um, you know, it, it's in it, different people see it a different way. But, but I, 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 I think we, we, have, we have made progress um, mm -hmm. with uh, decision making and implementation technologies that, that gives me uh, great hope. Great hope. Also, too, uh, if we can continue the wind farms and maybe we can avert um, any possible drilling in the Atlantic Ocean, which is... Uh, just was unfortunately given the green light as far as um, I was informed. So hopefully we can do something with wind and, and use of the sea. I hope so too. Thank you again for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you, Mary Kay, for doing it. And again, I want to thank uh, our guest, Dr. James McCarthy, for his discussion. And remember, this is, for, this is for informational purposes only. It is not legal or business advice. And we look forward to having you join us again next time for more of the Legal Edition.